listening to Podium Podcast with Simon Hartley and Tom May. This is the show that invites the world's top athletes to discuss life in and after professional sport. Podium Podcast is brought to you by True Potential Wealth Management. To find out more, visit domorewithyourmoney.co.uk. Simon, good to be back. Cricket this yep. time. Indeed. England cricket, well spotted. Yeah. England cricket. England cricket. How are you doing? Good. Yes. Uh, being on rural Wi-Fi, I'll probably join you in about five seconds' time. Yeah. Uh, that is one thing that I am going to buy you next Christmas. You've got a long time to wait, given it's January, but I'm going to get you a new contract for your Wi-Fi. Anyway, we've got Chris Cook, um, former Olympian, Commonwealth medalist, been to the Athens and uh, Beijing Olympics. This guy knows his way around the pool, and you work with him. Yeah, for seven, eight years, a sports psychologist and athlete, known him for 20 now. Yeah, he does. He also knows his way around his own head. Um, you know, he, he understands his own mind, which is quite unique, honestly, in, in athlete, athletic terms, I think. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, from from what we've discovered over the, over the past um, few episodes, very difficult for athletes to quieten down that mind and actually get a grip of what's going on in, in the situation that they they find themselves when they make transition. Um, but certainly it sounds like Chris has got that nailed down. So let's let's crack on and get stuck into the podcast. Absolutely. Chris Cook, good to have you with us. Thanks for the I think, I don't know whether it's a compliment or not, but you're bringing up the rear of season two. <laughs> That's the rumour. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you with us. A Geordie, a Geordie, uh, finally. Have we had another one? I'm sure we must have had another one. Oh, we're everywhere, mate. Off, mate. You get everywhere, don't they? How are you doing? <laughs> Very well. How's yourselves? I'm good, thank you. I'm good for a Monday as we're recording. A Monday <laughs> afternoon at five o'clock. It's, it's that time of day, isn't it? Twilight <laughs> zone. <laughs> how's, how's things with you anyway? What are you up to? Yeah, really good. Do you know what? It comes straight into this year. Really, really busy, but but full of the busy stuff that I really wanted to be busy doing, because that's normally the answer people give, isn't it? Oh, how's things going? Oh, I'm dead busy. <laughs> but actually doing the stuff that I really, really enjoy doing, and that was one big thing that I'd kind of come across last year that was just doing stuff that just wasn't relevant, and I had to strip it out. Um, so, yeah, coming into this year, feeling bouncy as ever. We're talking, we're talking like, relevant. Um what sort of things were those that you didn't didn't find work for you? Oh, that's a good one, that one. You know, working with working with people is my thing. That's what I love doing. I yeah. love working with people. I love helping people find their find their potential and earth it, all that sort of buzzy stuff that people say. But I really genuinely love working with people. And I found myself more and more working on all the processes and the systems and the, I was like, Oh, what am I doing here? It's not where I'm best suited. So I just started, like, outlaying it all, just sending it off to people who love doing that stuff. <laughs> but it's taken yeah. so long to get to that position in business where I can afford to do it time-wise and monetary-wise. So mm. Plain and so simple. A lot of people would kind of look at you as an a, a, an individual athlete, athlete quote-unquote. You know, here's Chris. He plays up and down a pool all day. Um, yeah. And, and probably imagine that maybe the people stuff wouldn't be your thing because, right, you must be an introvert if you're going to just plow up and down a pool. <laughs> but it would be the completely wrong, completely wrong impression of you, right? Yeah, big time. Look, I am an introvert. I'm a painful introvert. <laughs> But I've learned to, I've learned to extrovert myself just at the right time and the right right ways. But if I do that too much, it absolutely zaps me energy. It really does. I've got to be careful. But you're absolutely spot on. You know, I didn't realise when I come out of swimming, I went through a really tough phase, and I'm sure we'll get into the the bones of all that later in the discussion. But I went through a really tough phase, and when I got out the other end of that, I started to realise who I truly was. And actually, swimming in a weird way only serviced one element of that, and that was head down, off you go. That's, I'm really good at that. I'm a good blunt instrument. <laughs> Just keep going. But what, where, what I wasn't good at doing was the thing that I had to really dial up, and that was just working on myself for myself. Like, I'm a really good servant. I serve others much better than I serve myself. And because of that, the, the, the phase that I'm in now is more exciting for me. 
it's more exciting for me because it's not about the money. It's not about medals. It's not about podiums. It's not about me doing it. It's about me helping facilitate others do that. So I get a double kick. I get paid for the thing that I love doing. Which yeah, that's which like, is which is great when you come out of sport, right? Yeah. To, to, I keep saying I found it. I didn't find it. I created it, and that was the difference. Once I stopped searching and I stopped trying to find something and paused and started to create it, that's when the light bulb moments came. It was it was hiding in it, it was hiding in plain sight all the way along. We, uh, we had a we had a conversation with Jody Craddock uh, mm. very recently, and um, he uh, a Jody that was uh, that I work with, Steve Black. And we mentioned it in the conversation with, with Jody and Simon will know this is that it, he was always banging on about, do you know what? Find what it is that you like to do and find a way to make money out of it. That was mm. the message for him when he was talking about, you know, lot, I mean, he was talking to a group of spotty 19, 20 year olds at the time. Yeah. And we were like, oh yeah, we're, we're miles away from that happening. Um, but obviously it comes around to everyone. Yeah. Um, and if you can find that, which it sounds like you have, mm it makes life a pretty good place to be, right? It does. I think, look, everybody, I think me and Simon, we spoke about this so much. Everybody wants a future, don't they? That, that, that's what they're really working towards. They want to know they've got a future, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in a business, whether it's in a role. Everybody loves to know they've got a future and a place there. And I think at the time when I came out of swimming, I was looking for fake dopamine fixes, and I was finding them everywhere. They were, they're within reach of everything you do. I wasn't getting anywhere near the real dopamine fixes. I just wasn't able to because I didn't know what was ticking the box. So I went through this phase and I deliberately went through it of just experimenting. And it was off the back of a conversation we'd had years ago, Simon, when you said, let's just experiment because it can't fail, we'll just get results. I was like, yeah, that really works for me. So we went experimenting. But the difficulty is other people didn't know what I was doing. So because they didn't know what I was doing, they became really critical. And as as a people pleaser, I'm a bit of a people pleaser, you know, sometimes I nod and go, yeah, 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 but on the inside I'm going, hell no, <laughs> tell them no, tell them no, but my mouth and my head saying yes. And I've had a battle with that and really to work with that. And that got me in a lot of, that got me into a pickle with a lot of people. <clears throat> so when they were cri being critical, I was kind of nodding going, oh yeah, really should listen to them. So I had this real like pendulum swinging moment of, are they right? Am I right? And I had to go through that really tricky phase, but honestly, hand on heart, I wouldn't change it for the world now. Not, not for where I am now. It's that myth of certainty, isn't it? You know, everybody's yeah. chasing this mythical thing called certainty. Um, yeah. You know, you come out of your swimming career, everybody wants the answer as to what yeah. you're going to do right now, because you ought to know it. It's the same with, you know, I'm watching my, my, kids growing up um phoebe's yeah. just in her a levels now and everybody's asking her what you're going to do as a career well god knows what she's going to do as a career honestly she's 16 years old i mean who does when they're 16 and who gets it right and yeah but yeah how have you got kids that old when you haven't got a gray hair on your head <laughs> <laughs> just for men <laughs> mate like my mine's six and 12 i haven't got a brown hair left on my head <laughs> it's ridiculous it's hiding I'm with him about this after this. <laughs> we hope you don't mind us interrupting this episode with a very brief shout out to our partners at the Podium Podcast, True Potential Wealth Management. At True Potential Wealth Management, their mission is to help you do more with your money. Expert financial advice, innovative investments and leading technology are all designed to put you in control and help you achieve your financial goals. To find out more about their specialist advice, investment opportunities and pension services, visit domorewithyourmoney.co.uk. That's domorewithyourmoney.co.uk. With investing, your capital is at risk. True Potential Wealth Management LLP is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get you back to this week's show. You talk about that certainty, Simon. I think there's a, people are asking, the last Chris, for example, what are you going to do when you finish, mm. finish swimming? Hardest thing, I think, for a lot of people, unless you're, I don't know, Jamie Roberts that's qualified to be a doctor, mm. um, 
what the hell am I going to do? Like, people are asking me. I've got no idea myself. Like, <laughs> it's it's it, those that are taking that route. Those that are taking that route to either work for themselves or develop their own ideas or have have a, some form of idea about what they want to do. Yeah, I think it's really you know that certainty that you're trying to find. I think it it always feels like it's one step further than where you are right now when you finish sport. It's a bit weird. I don't know whether I've explained that quite well, but it certainly feels like that. You're sort of you're never quite you're never quite there. But maybe that's that sort of mindset that we we sort of associate with sports people. What do you thought? What do you think, Chris? Yeah, definitely. I think I think you're right. I think there's a lot to be said for being done for the day, isn't there? You know that feeling when you get the end of a week or you get the end of a day and you feel like you've you laid something down, but you've got more to achieve next week. It's a great feeling. I went through about three or four years of my life where every single day was the exact opposite. I didn't want the weekend to come because I I was struggling to relax and regenerate. I wasn't using the weekends to create my life. I was using it to escape my life. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. And I think, you know, what, what really helped me was having that conversation with myself to being willing to start again. That's what really helped me is I was frightened to start again. I'd been at the pinnacle. My last ever race was an, an Olympic final. To put it to put it into context, it was the last race that Michael Phelps won his eighth gold medal. That was the last time I raced. So you can imagine the euphoria of being in an Olympic final and the euphoria of being in a final that is so historic. It's still spoken about today. I was in, in that final. So to come back home to the Northeast to sit in my house and go, what next it was just a massive come down mm. and I needed to be willing to start again. And a huge part of that was silence and me ego. Getting I was going to say, do you think that's pride? Massive, massive. And I'm not an ego driven lad. Like, you know, you get to know us and I'm just not that way inclined, but I've still got an ego, <laughs> still got an ego going, yeah, those people, you know, you've got to be better than those. And the competitive edge comes out. I've realized it's just a fake dopamine fix that. Simon, uh, you've come across athletes from all different sports. And, I mean, when I was on, a, on the field, you'd say I'd had a massive ego, but actually off the field, I'd like to think I wasn't like that. You might say that's complete bollocks. And, um, <laughs> but, but actually, you know, Chris is saying the same. I mean, all athletes have to have ego, right? Yeah. I think we all do. We all have an ego. You know, the, the very fact that, you know, we kind of we, we're conscious about what we get dressed in, in you know, which clothes we wear in the morning shows that we've got an ego. Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't, mate. And if you want to see what he's watching, head over to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's that it, the ego is the bit of ourselves that's worried about what other people think. It's the bit of ourselves that wants everybody to like us. It presents ourselves to the to the world, you know. So yeah, we do care about what other people think to a certain extent, and we, we care how they judge us to a certain extent. So we've all got one. Um, I think you're right. It's how it <laughs> how it operates. I think that's probably yeah. the key issue. Um, we, we, whether it, holds us back or helps propel us forwards because in a lot of people's cases it holds them back whether you've got an ego though probably when you transition if you're one of those guys that says a bit like chris said that just there you know i I didn't really have an ego actually you do when you're in the pool yeah and that's when loads of people are watching you actually as we all know that those that go through sports transition no one gives a shit when you walk out the change room door So so actually it's the time when actually you can have no ego and you can do those those things, oh, that was a massive mistake, or I don't like this, or you don't have to be really good at something. I yeah. think the, the the patience of a sports person, it, it's not exactly, it's not exactly uh, something that, that, that many, many of us, I don't think, are very good at, at being very yeah. patient. I want to get there now, and I want it right now, and I want, then I want to move further forward. Yeah. I think that's probably the problem combined with that ego thing because we still feel that people are watching us actually no one cares that's a hundred percent right that's so true you know i remember years ago hearing um someone say to someone who was checking out their outfit just said listen go to that event get there and just forget about what you look like because people will look you up and down for 30 seconds and then concentrate on how they feel and look about themselves. And it's so true. They'll spend the rest of the night just concerned about how they look and feel. And they won't give you a second glance. 
and and I think it's that ditching that nobody's watching or everybody's watching me is you've got to ditch it. You've got to leave it at the door. You know, one's a story, the other one's a fact. And it's, mm. and it, it's like, you know, I, I came to a realization that I don't have a life. I, I am a life, but it took me a lot of soul searching to get there. And it sounds quite like I'm just splitting words. Up. I'm not really. One of them is a story that we attach ourselves to. And the other one is a fact. <laughs> And we have these, we have these explanations for our life, but actually that it's just a story and we get to pick up the pen and write the story. And it took me a long, long time to, to really do that. But the second I did, the second I st stepped across the other side of that fence was when my life took off again, absolutely took off again. And you're right about being able to kind of leave the ego at the door, because as you said, you're going to start again. You're going to become an absolute novice in yeah. something. So if you're really wrapped yeah. up in what will people think of me? What happens if I don't succeed at this? You know, what if I fail at this thing? Uh, if you get all wrapped up in that, the problem yeah. is you, you probably won't even start. Um, if you hit a couple of hurdles yeah. and you're not great at it initially, you might give it up. And if you want to find a new path in life, you've got to accept you're going to be a beginner. You're going to make tons of mistakes. You're probably going to look a bit, a bit ropey yeah. to start with because that's how it works. Well, we also... Well, Simon, especially on a Monday evening, his goat outside the out the house on it running his internet runs out of steam. <laughs> <laughs> so we might lose him occasionally here, or, or he might start talking about what we were talking about ten minutes ago. But we'll find out. Um, I, I think um, Chris, it's interesting listening to your your sort of comments about transition. Mm. What, what specifically around transition? What were the really dark times? What were the what were the what were the bits that made you think, do you know what? This is probably more tough than any sessions I've had in the pool. Yeah. Um, you've, you've actually like really triggered the, the, the problem there. And I think that was, it was overthinking. Thinking was the problem. And I thought I could think my way out of it. I couldn't. So that was the first thing. The second thing was I was reflecting without reflecting properly. So I was reflecting, have you ever said, I'm sure you guys are the same, you've looked back on a year and you go, oh, that was a bloody good year that year. You know, you, 2006 was a great year. Do you ever do that? Yeah. But actually, if you reflect properly, I bet there was loads of crap moments. <laughs> in that yeah. Year. yeah. But actually, because you, I don't know, you, you got a kick right or whatever, or you, you no, That never happened. <laughs> <laughs> never, ever happened. But I look back on 2005 and six, and I was like, I couldn't do anything wrong. And I spent a bit of time reading through the um, training diary. And I was like, oh, my God, 2005 and 2006 sounded like an utter nightmare <laughs> with the comments that I'd written and what I'd put in there. But in my mind, oh, I'd stood on podiums, I'd traveled the world. They were the heydays. So actually, I needed mm. to get a little bit of a gauge of what was, what was success again and what did it take to get there? You know, by the time I'd come around to thinking of a, putting a business plan in place, I was strategizing far too much. I was sitting there trying to work it out and trying to make it perfect instead of just getting out there and failing. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the space of time I wrote a business plan and put the strategy together, someone was already out there getting pool time and failing nine, ten times. They were massively ahead of us. Yeah. And once I started to get through that part of the transition, that was when... Like I say, it really took off, but the dark moments were just, yeah, they were walking outside, putting a fake smile on, but inside just absolutely dying, just dying. I remember walking down Northumberland Street in Newcastle, and this was this is where my life changed this one day. I was walking down the, down the road, and all the stuff that was familiar to us just was not, not familiar anymore. I'd walked down that street millions of times going to training, and nothing was familiar realized in that moment that everything that something had to change everything was just all in the wrong order and did I you get that feeling of the sort of it's like a, I, I found that it was like a sort of heavy fog yeah you're just I, wait and you and you don't you're not thinking about anything you're yeah. looking but you're not seeing yeah uh and you're just you time feels like it's taking ages and you're like shit i've done nothing it's the whole yeah. day's gone that's exactly um, so weird it is weird. It's almost out of body, and I couldn't. I could. I was almost watching myself walking up the street, 
that was the moment I was like, something's got to change here. Um, mm. but I guess from the outside, nobody knew what was going on because I'm really good at game facing it. I, well, I'm, 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 I, that's what I did for a living. <laughs> I got out there and put a game face on it and did it really well. So how how did you emerge from that? Because you must have done something differently. It doesn't just happen on its own. So what did you start yeah. doing differently when you got that awareness? I, I got really ruthless with the things in people that weren't helping. I'll be brutal. I'll be honest. There were people and things in my life that were not helping me. I wasn't helping them, if I'm honest. It just wasn't real. We were going through the motions and... Yeah, I had a bit of a spring clean. I had a clean out. And it was the best thing I ever did for me and probably for them, for the things that just weren't contributing. So I went through it all and was just really honest and open about it. This is just not adding any value and it's not helping any of us. Mm. And then I started to ask questions like, well, what sort of stuff do I want to do on a daily basis? If I was to design my perfect week, what would it look like? Even though I'm a million miles away, what would it look like? But things came up like, oh, nobody's going to pay me for that. I'm not qualified. I can only stare at a black line and blast up and down and stink of chlorine all day. All, all those kind of imposter moments came back. Instead of just answering the question, which was, I would love to do this and I'd love to get paid for it. And I'd love to get paid this much and I'd love to eventually be saying this. And then I just made a start. I started phone calling people. I started reaching out to people, telling them, sharing it. And pulling people closer who I knew would help me out. And I started to create a brand new team. That's effectively what I was doing. But I was relying on the old team to do the new stuff. That just wasn't working. Did you and, did you find yourself kind of uh, chasing the outcome and kind of getting locked in a cycle of yeah. chasing an outcome rather than, like you said, doing the stuff that took you in the direction that you wanted to go? Yeah. I started, you know, focusing on money. Money was the thing that gave me that dopamine fix. I was like, brilliant, I've earned X amount. I've never earned that much, but I was doing the stuff I hated. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to sit down and work out, actually, when I do this, I have a great feeling because I'm helping people. And hey, guess what? People pay for it. And weirdly, once I started focusing on that, people started paying us three, four, five times more than what I was getting before. Mm -hmm. I was coming to the end of a week and feeling refreshed and not, like beaten down and yeah, so much. I, th I think it's easy for sports people to get sucked into that though, yeah. for the obvious reason that you're like, well, you're suddenly of a realization that you were basically blagging a living as a sports person. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like to get paid to get paid what some people get paid now. It's like, yeah. you know, you go out. Uh, there's probably I reckon fifty players, maybe I'm just making figures up in 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 Premiership rugby that are only three hundred grand plus. There'll yeah. be a lot of them. You go and get 300 grand in the centre of town, you spend a lot of years grafting at one particular business or you've come out of one and gone into the top of the other. Um, so there's an understanding, there's a realisation of of what it takes to earn a tenner in the real world, I think, so that you, you naturally gravitate to, like, how am I going to pay for the rent or how am I going to pay for the mortgage or whatever it is. Yeah. And then I think sometimes you're just – then you get into the mentality where you said you're, you're head down and you'll get after it. Yeah. And, and then actually you don't get your head up yeah. <laughs> um, because you just get sucked onto that cycle. And it's really difficult then, I think, to, to step back. Um, it, is. it is. I think there's, there's a couple of things in that. You know, what, one of them was the realisation, and we've spoken about this before, Simon, that I got trapped in that cycle of the tangible stuff that you can touch and feel, money, medals, chasing that. The moment I realized that I was chasing the wrong things was the moment I realized that I was focused on the wrong gold. So if you mm -hmm. think about any journey, the real gold is you because you get to take that every single way you go. Even, even if you change careers and go somewhere completely different, go left field, there will be undoubtedly transferable things that you can take across 100%, even if it's a different perspective from a different industry. And I think that's the key is understanding your worth in those moments that you get to take that worth everywhere that was really hard to find in that transition because i just couldn't see it so what where you focused on 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 pound signs previously yeah. what are your main focuses now as you running your own business your coaching business what are your what are your right that is that's 
that's bronze level achievement, that's silver level, that's gold level. What are, the, what are those, if you can let us in on those? For me, it's just service. All comes down to service. So every client is completely different. I don't use the same tools. I don't use the same approach. I ask different questions. I get on their agenda. So for me, that that's the tick in the box. It's not necessarily the pound signs at the end. It's the, have I done what I said I'd do? And have I given you better value at the end of the process or even during the process? So again, when I'm stood on stage and I'm sharing a story or I'm sharing some anecdotal things, what I'm really trying to do in that moment, I'm really trying to harness my message. That's all I'm doing. I'm just using stories to do it. So actually, when I ask for the feedback, I'm asking for, am I a great storyteller and am I landing this message? Because all I want to do is improve your life just 1%. That's it. That's my mission. Mm. So if you if you listen to what I've kind of just read through there, it's all about service. And it's the same now in our Learn to Swim business. You know, we've got over a 1,000 kids in our academy that swim with us every week, which makes my heart pound a little bit faster, the pride, but also a, a, a bit of panic as well. I'm like, wow, I've got to manage that. We've got to do that. But actually the questions we ask on a daily basis, are we getting the service right? Don't always get it right. That's okay. You know, we'll get emails with with disgruntled parents saying we want better, right? That's, that's our next target. We need to do better. And at first we used to panic. Oh my God, we're not doing a great job. No, no, no. We are doing a great job. We just want to do an exceptional one. That's the difference. It's what you pin yourself against, isn't it? That's it. And you know, we've, we've had moments where we've just tried and tested things and they've fallen flat on their faces. But we know what not to do. And it goes back to that transition. I tried a load of things. I tried to become a PT. Didn't really enjoy it. I tried doing loads of different things. Just didn't enjoy them. I knew what I didn't want to be. And I think sometimes by going out and experiment, that's the real benefit. You mm. understand what's not for you. I know for a fact that I'm unmanageable in a, in a role. <laughs> I can't be employed. I'm unmanageable. I'm too much of a tail in, the, tail in the air in the field, off dreaming. And I know that really annoys some people. So to be employed is just not a place I need to be. But I know that because I've been in that position and it was bloody hard and I would never go back to it. Mm. That, um, that, so that, question, that question, Tom, about, you know, what does the gold look like now? What does bronze look like now uh, is a really good question, because when I talk to people about mm -hmm. applying sports thinking or, uh, you know, sort of translating sports thinking into business, um, one of the, the comebacks usually from business people is, yeah, but sports really easy because the, the goal is clear. There's a trophy, there's a medal, you know, it's it's really clear and you've got a good an easy benchmark to use you know you're top of the league bottom of the league whatever it's not the same in business and that's absolutely true it's not the same in business and and i think you're right if we're not careful all we do is swap gold for pound shillings and pence or something like that and and equally we we haven't really found what the true goal is we've we've just gone for an easy one that's that's you know it's right there we can adopt it really easily but it's not necessarily what success really looks like um and and going back to what I think you one said, of the things uh chris oh, so so going back to what chris said earlier sorry, mate, about, your goat the, stopped yeah my my wi-fi is um uh, no better than it has been ever well i'm now two or three seconds behind, <laughs> not even not even one and a half seconds behind um but yeah going back to what you said earlier about the the real value that you took from your swimming career it, Yes, the medal, you got medals at the end of it. But but as you, you've said to me a load of times, who you became through the journey was the real yeah. value. Yeah, absolutely. Like shy lad, wouldn't say anything, wouldn't stand up for anything. You know, I was a people pleaser and, just, and I still am. And I, like I say, I battle with that. And I'm really honest and open, but unrecognizable for the guy who stepped into swimming to the guy who left it. And, and again, another phase I'm going through, which is just learning to become a leader and a businessman and, and that's a, that's got its own set of challenges but that's the bit that i love now is that that changes you just a little bit if you accept the challenge and when you accept the challenge and you do change and you, you're almost changing more from experience and wisdom I, I love that journey when a client takes that that journey mm -hmm. but it's the same as keeping an eye on it yourself as well you talk about you being um a people pleaser 
is that is that something you have to be as a, as a swimmer? As it because you're going to get in the pool and you're going to do what your coach says? Or no, I, th- I think you have to be coachable. I think being coachable and being a people pleaser are very different traits. But yeah, a people pleaser is kind of that you know that awkward feeling of just wanting everybody in the room to be okay and happy in your presence. That outer harmony is what I call it. You know when you tap into that outer harmony quite easily as a people pleaser. Mm-hmm. The, detriment, the detrimental side can be where you're on other people's agenda too much if you're not careful and you're not on your own. And when you are on your own, you see it as a real selfish act and not a personal one because there's a big difference between those two. So I've done a lot of work to kind of loosen them up and separate them and know when to employ that people pleaser and when not. Yeah. Great door opening skill, people pleaser. <laughs> yeah. And oh, learned- so is just brute force. Sometimes <laughs> just, keep, just keep knocking. I've got a, I, there's a there's a story. I was uh, I was doing some work for someone, and uh, I was desperate to try and get hold of this guy. And uh, I must have messaged him, emailed him, got tried to get hold of him about six times, and he just emailed me back. He said, "Bloody hell, you are so persistent. Just come and see me." Anyway, I went and saw him, and I was sat in this coffee shop, and I was just waiting for him to walk in and just click me around the head and just say like. <laughs> I just wanted you to come up here so I could smack you around the head. Now piss off! <laughs> but but he, uh, he was actually all right, and we get on really well now. So, but that persistency, you know, that's one of those. I go so that you're not going to beat me. I will get in that door. You just, you uh, just, you just try and hold me out. Um, I've got, I've got a friend of mine who's uh, he's got a couple of kids uh, that are really into their swimming, yeah. and he talks to me about some of the training sessions. Just for those, for the listeners of this this podcast now. Um, that haven't really understood about what swimming training is about. It is bonkers. Like I've done some bad sessions in my time, but none of them have been 4.30 in the morning going up and down a pool. Uh, <laughs> so, so just tell us, give us a bit of a sort of, uh, I mean, um, Rebecca Adlington gave, gave us a bit of an insight, but some of your thoughts on what, what swimming training is about. Yeah, it is brutal. It is brutal. Look, you, you've got to take it incrementally and you've got to build it up sensibly. So good coaching all the way through your pathway is dead important. You are up early. You're up four, four thirty. get to the pool for five o'clock, get it ready. Doesn't get ready for you. Um, <clears throat> you get in, you blast up and down for a couple of hours, usually covering anywhere between three, three and a half, four miles of swimming, whatever it is. You get out, you get your breakfast, you refuel, You'll hit the gym for an hour or two. If you're a sprinter, you'll do it longer. Um, and then on an evening, you're back again for another two-hour session at four o'clock. And it's that's every day. You get a bit, a bit of time at the weekend if you're lucky. But other than that, you'll be racing. If you race through, you get up Monday morning, you're up for 4.30 again, and you're back after it. And now that, that must be mental. It, it, you know, with all due respect to swimmers, because that takes a lot of respect to be able to do that day in, day out. That must be one of the most mon- monotonous routines over time. Yeah, it is. But then you bury yourself in the detail. You know, once you get into it, there's so many ways to measure it. There's so many different ways to measure it. And that's the obsessive side of someone. That, that for me, was great because I could measure it. E- week on week, I had targets and goals. So you'd wake up on a Tuesday morning. You knew what was expected of you. You knew the type of session that you were going to. Some days you were dragging yourself through the door. Other days you were skipping through. Mm. And you have to manage that energy and that emotion and them expectations. And, you know, you think that your body's going to do one thing and it tells you another thing. And that's not easy. It's not to- easy. Today you are sinking. <laughs> <laughs> that's what mine says to me. Anyway, 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 anytime I get near a pool, it's like you <laughs> and the bottom are going to become best friends. <laughs> <laughs> but someone like Rebecca would have done, like, almost double what anybody else was doing because she had double the distance and more to go at. She was mm. a fierce competitor and an even more fierce training person. You know, she just she was just she was just dedicated to it. It was phenomenal to see. And when you surround yourself with people like her, when you surround yourself with world class people, you know, they raise your bar because you see them doing go, well there's a standard. Here we go. Mm. And it not, not not just that competitive edge comes out, but that's just that wow, I'm intrigued to see how much I can push it. Honestly, three quarters of my career was, well, I've got this far. I wonder if I could go a bit further. That's that. That's what went through my mind on a regular basis. If I could just do one more session, I reckon I'm doing all right. And I ended up doing 20 years of it. 
it's a it's a really good point because a lot of people again if they're if they're in business and they hear a, uh, an athlete telling their story about relentlessly chasing down this goal or relentlessly applying themselves to to what is a fairly narrow discipline usually swimming up and down a pool or throwing a javelin or whatever it is the the thought process is oh my god that must get quite boring monotonously monotonously boring but like you say it becomes interesting when you look within the discipline at all the things you can do that little bit better and and the distraction doesn't come from kind of outside it's not i'd yeah. rather focus on something outside of it you're looking within it to find where the interest and the curiosity is about how you improve this thing it's true you know the, the work that you do i understand i understood very early on my early coach was a guy called ken nesworthy and still a really good friend now and then i moved on to ian oliver and they both had very similar philosophies you know hard work still works Hard work still works. And it's the stuff, it's the work you do that no one sees is the reason you get seen. It's it's those, it's the stuff you do in the dark that people don't see, that when they do see you, they go, oh, man, he's, he's amazing at that. Yeah, well, you haven't seen what's, what's gone in there, you know. Well, it's like that, that, like that picture of the... Um the iceberg where you know they've got they've got the they're on the top of the iceberg and they're holding their medal or whatever it might be actually all of the shits underneath the water yeah. all of the yeah. stuff where you you know you're in pain or you can't train or you're dealing with all sorts I look, i'm really interested to pick your brains given the focus and in my opinion the the enhanced difficulty of being an olympic based athlete mm. Um, and the professionalism demonstrated by those athletes in comparison to rugby, football, cricket, generally. Um, today, um, when as we record, uh, Great Britain's Ellie Downey, 23, she's retired from gymnastics, 23, nice. to protect her mental health and happiness. Now, some people from outside of sport will be going, what, what on earth is she talking about? You're doing the thing you love. What you're turning your back on it just just weak. That's what will be leveled at her from some some corners of society. Um, now, there's a whole different other argument there. But what what comes with doing? We see so many more problems. I feel mm -hmm. within Olympic based sports, and I think that's because it's very much self driven. I, I get into a change room and there's. 45 of us and you're in it together and there's an element whereby that will drag you along um now perhaps perhaps i'm completely wrong but that's just me not my feeling i was just you know it's really interesting to see that a 23 year old girl has just turned her back on something that she clearly loves yeah what that, are your thoughts on that I, th I think it's sad first and foremost look i don't i don't believe that these challenges we need to forget about our mental health or our well-being. Mm. I think you can do both hand in hand. You know, mm. I put out a post a couple of weeks ago about resilience and I said, you know, has resilience become a dirty word? And I was really trying to antagonize the industry really or just antagonize the crowd and draw a few people out. And a few people really took not very kindly to it. And they jumped straight onto well-being. As soon as I mentioned resilience, they jumped onto well-being straight away. Now the two are completely different things. However, they need to be in harmony in order to get the best out of ourselves. Those two things absolutely run and truly need to be in harmony. But just because we're talking about being more resilient doesn't mean to say that we need to let go of our well-being. So it's understanding example, both, surely, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Look, you know, at the moment we're going, we, we've gone through a really, swimming's gone through a really, really difficult patch. If there's a sport that's been hit hard in COVID, it's swimming. It was the first to close and the last to open. And the grassroots of it is is really, really struggling. Clubs are struggling, learn to swims are all sorts. The industry's been turned upside down by COVID. And I said to my wife, when we first came out of COVID, I said, we've really got to double down on two things. One, the challenge that's coming our way, and the business challenge. And secondly, our challenge is two things that are happening there. The second one, which is our challenge, involves us dialing up our well-being, looking after ourselves, getting some good rest not taking on any other sinister challenges and get, getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work. And we just systematically did it. Now that was us dialing up that well-being, working out what's going to help us and what's not, what's useful, what's useless, get rid if it's useless. And we became like what I call gently ruthless. Nobody knew we were doing it. We were doing it privately. And it, it saddens me that people reach a stage in sport and make that decision. Because what it says to me is, 
those two things haven't been going hand in glove. They've mm. been potentially, which is, it, I'm sure it's the same for you, Tom, when you were going through spot, you would get to the stage where you were just getting patched up and getting back out there again. You know, you yeah. get patched up, bang, get back out there. And it was all about time. Can we reduce the time down? Can we, so you can play for this weekend? Can you get, can you get on the field? Can we count on him? You know, the physios will be doing it. All sorts of people will be working on you. It was the same in swimming. Can we sort this guy's groin injury out before the next weekend? Or will he be okay for the Europeans? And, you know, it's a constant phase of repatching, get back out there. But it shouldn't be at the detriment of your mental well-being or your, or your no. health. I think the physical well-being, the, resili- the resilience side, it's that, that inner toughness to, okay, how far are you willing to go to, yeah. to, to, to play or to swim or whatever it might be? Now, you can go to that point but not affect your well-being. Yeah. I think it's a different, it's a different thing. Now, th- there are, I reckon you play one game a year where in rugby where you're 100% fit and that's the first preseason game. After that, you've just sort of got bits hanging off or bits taped up and, you know, your nose is across your face or whatever it might be. Um, and and I think there's an understanding, well, yeah, this just comes with the job. Now, obviously, we're trying to make uh, rugby as a sport safer than than, uh, than many others for for those that are playing the game. But I think that's that's part of everyone that got involved knew that that was coming. But now... Now I've stepped out of sport. I'm now becoming far more aware of my my mental well being or my mental health than I than I ever probably let myself. Yeah. You know, I, d- I didn't let myself have any focus on it. I'm feeling like shit. No, you know, no, you're not. Get on with it. Yeah. Um, and and that's an element that, that comes with sport that probably needs adaptation. But you can't. At the same time, you need to block that out. Otherwise, you never go to the lengths that you do go to, if you see what I mean. And, and I think we, 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 um, we reflected on this um, when we were talking to uh, Jack Green a while ago. For me, the reason why you push yourself is critical. And sometimes there's a positive driver there. And, you know, often you're passionate about what you do. You want to test yourself. You want to push yourself to see how far you can go, um, explore your potential. And other times you're driven by a fear of failure, um, you haven't got anything else in life. You have to be successful at this thing because otherwise life's a disaster. You know, that that's it can be a powerful driver, but not necessarily a positive one. And so that that's absolutely critical. But as yeah. Chris said, you don't it's not resilience or well being. Um when I when I talk to people often about um resilience, when are you at your most resilient, when you're at your least resilient? Because we haven't got a fixed level of resilience. Most people will say my resilience is probably less when I haven't slept well, when lots of little things have chipped away at me and when I haven't been looking after myself. You know, I I don't respond as resiliently as I often would. And it, it tells us that actually the foundation for resilience usually comes from looking after ourselves. Yeah, too right. There's a, there's a little thing I'd add to that for for those that are probably going through dry January right now. <laughs> uh, as I am. Um, oh my God, it makes you feel good. Yeah. Uh, like in terms of a month of resilience, oh, I'm in it. Oh, you <laughs> cannot beat me this month. Oh, I'm going to run that fast. I'm going to lift that. It's going to be the strongest. Work. I'm all over it. I know for a fact on the first weekend of February when I go out for my birthday, that week following, my resilience is down. Now, now if you think of the productivity that people will be noticing all over January. I've got people talking to me about it all the time. Oh, I feel great. The sleep's good. This and the other. Mm, it's not surprising that, is it? Yeah. And you talk about you talk about resilience and and how you can enhance those things that you do around you to gain the little one percenters. It's things like that that make such a big difference. Um, uh, Chris, we could talk to you for hours, but I've got four of the best questions coming your way. <laughs> um, if you hadn't been a swimmer. So if you hadn't jumped in a pool and looked at the bottom for hours on end, um, what would you have been and what, what would you have become? Oh, good one. Do you know, when I was a kid, I really wanted to be in the police force. Um, but And weirdly enough, I would have probably just gone down that route without even thinking about it. That would have been the worst job for me, I'm being honest. <laughs> <laughs> you might have been told what to do there, mate. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would have been dreadful at it. Absolutely dreadful. The amount of people I would have just let off with all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People pleasing. So I would have gone down that route and I would have never gone to uni. I would have never gone to uni. Fact. At sport actually changed my life as cheesy as it sounds. I don't care. I would have never gone to university because nobody in my family had gone at that stage. So I was the first first person, first generation to even think about it. But it was sport that made me go, oh, well, if I did that, would they pay for it? Yeah, let's do it. Like it. Like it. What? Who do you admire most in sport and in business? Oh, can it be anyone? Anyone. David Atten. It can be even be Simon, if you like. <laughs> oh, he's a close second. <laughs> It's gonna be, it's gonna be, guys, a legend. You don't mind coming second to him, do you? Not at all. Honoured, devastated. <laughs> he's so devastated. He's talking five seconds behind you. <laughs> uh, for those of you that are new to the podcast, Simon doesn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've got some funds to invest, Chris. Yeah. Um, what are you going to invest it in? What Ooh. crazy idea are you going to invest it in? Right here, right now, it would be a holiday home in the sun. Oh, nice. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So many people have gone, oh, there's this amazing business coming or a bit of crypto here, a bit of this, that, there. You've just gone, no, bit of sun, please. Big time, with a family. And yeah. just let it out as well and make some money. Hey, it. I've not heard that. A Geordie after a tan. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I would never have put that together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's white and left. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, last, last one. When you're on that, when you're in that house and you're, you've got your holiday home in the sun, you can only watch one film for the yeah. rest of your life. What's it going to be? Ah, oh, Forrest Gump all the way. It's class. It's got everything. Like it's got it. Everything. It was, that was too easy for you. That question. Well, that stumped some people. Oh no! That's completely thrown them. Uh, I know. I know what I like. <laughs> like it Chris uh, Simon I think you'll, you'll probably agree it's, you'll probably tell me in 10 minutes when I finish the question uh, it's been great to have you uh, <laughs> it's been great to have you on the podcast mate um, you know we could have talked to you for hours um, but but hopefully we can, we can have you back again at, at some point it'd be brilliant to talk to you again I would love to thank you so much fellas really appreciate that see you soon mate cheers see you there listening to Podium Podcast with Simon Hartley and Tom May. This is the show that invites the world's top athletes to discuss life in and after professional sport. Podium Podcast is brought to you by True Potential Wealth Management. To find out more, visit domorewithyourmoney.co.uk.